midway in the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood, for the straight way was lost. It is so bitter that death is hardly more so. But to treat of the good that I found in it, I will tell of the other things I saw there. I cannot rightly say how I entered it. I was so full of sleep at the moment I left the true way. But when I had reached the foot of a hill, there at the end of the valley that had pierced my heart with fear, I looked up and saw its shoulders already clad in the rays of the planet that leads men aright by every path. Then the fear was somewhat quieted that had continued in the lake of my heart through the night I had passed so piteously. And as he who with laboring breath has escaped from the deep to the shore turns to look back on the dangerous waters, so my mind, which was still fleeing, turned back to gaze upon the past that never left anyone alive. After I had rested my tired body a little, I again took up my way across the desert strand so that the firm foot was always the lower. And behold, near the beginning of the steep, a leopard, light-footed and very fleet, covered with a spotted hide. And it did not depart from before my eyes, but it so impede my way that more than once I turned round to go back. It was the beginning of the morning, and the sun was mounting with the stars that were in it when divine love first set those beautiful things in motion so that the hour of the day and the sweet season gave me cause for good hope of that beast with the dappled skin. Yet not so much that I didn't feel afraid of the sight of a lion that appeared to me and seemed to be coming at me, head high and raging with hunger, so that the air seemed to tremble at it. And a she-wolf that in her leanness seemed laden with every craving and had already caused many to live in sorrow. She put such heaviness upon me with the fear that came from sight of her that I lost hope of the height. And like one who is eager in winning, but when the time comes that makes him lose, weeps and is saddened in all his thoughts, such did that peaceless beast make me as coming on against me. She pushed me back little by little to where the sun was silent. While I was running down to the depth, there appeared before me one who seemed faint through long silence. When I saw him in that vast desert, I cried to him, Have pity on me, whatever you are, shade or living man. No, not a living man, though once I was, he answered me. And my parents were Lombards, both Mantuans by birth. I was born sub Julio, although late. And I lived at Rome under the good Augustus in the time of the false and lying gods. I was a poet. And I sang of that just son of Anchises who came from Troy after proud Ilium was burned. But you, why do you return to so much woe? Why do you not climb the delectable mountain, the source and cause of every happiness? Are you then that Virgil, that font which pours forth so broad a stream of speech? I answered him, my brow covered with shame. O oh, glory and light of other poets, may the long study and the great love that have made me search your volume avail me. You are my master and my author. You alone are he from whom I took the fair style that has done me honor. Let me, uh, before jumping into the reading of the text, let me just, I have a little of uh, uh, greetings to uh, read, uh, just to say that it's my welcome duty and my privilege to express my gratitude to be part of this historic event. I have been preparing for an event like this 
since last year uh, for, uh, um, uh, in fact, I've been preparing for the memorial celebration of the seventh century since Dante's death. He died in 1321. And the coming year, 2021, will be devoted in many, par in many parts of the world, from Florence to the United States, from the Latin Americas to Asia, to remember Dante's the poet and to reflect on how the Divine Comedy is for all of us a continuous source of inspiration. Um, these two events uh, of today, here, and uh, what will happen next year, hopefully, have a common inspirational figure uh, behind it, which whom I would like to recall here, Father Giussani. Um, it, was, it was Father Giussani um, who was, I recall uh, vividly, was just to tell me in many of the annual meetings we would have, thanks to his prodigious imagination and sensibility, he would say, Dante could be entering and reviving the world of ancient Rome and its grandeur, and we have to come to understand, thanks to him, that he has laid the vital foundations of our modern world, that thanks to uh, his uh, create creativity in thought and sensibility, we have inherited the legacy of the classical culture of Rome, which today is right here in the wonderful peace of New York City. So thank you for having me here now. Now, the, um, what I, um, my immediate role here now is to read something about uh, Virgil, the way he figures in the Divine Comedy. So, I decided that I should share with you a few facts about who is Virgil historically. Uh, he is cast, as we know in the Divine Comedy, as the moral guide of Dante, as a distinct central character role at the very outset of the Divine Comedy. From the start, Virgil's status in the poem is that of a trusted guide in Dante's journey. He guides him, a status which arises in large measure from the Aeneid, he wrote, with its narrative of Aeneas' historical journey from Troy through the infernal city of Dis, and after facing the challenges and battles along the routes, uh, he reaches while carrying his old father, Anchises, on his shoulders and his son by the hand, the shores of Italy where Rome would be founded by his descendants and he is, ends up being called, Virgil ends up being called the father of Rome. The city and uh, the sphere that Rome ruled was founded as the sacred seat of all inheritors of, great, uh, of the great Saint Peter. That's the uh, statement there. He was ordained uh, in an Imperian skies, uh, father of Rome, its noble heart and empire to speak the truth that city and the sphere it ruled, uh, a synthetic view of Rome's historical role as a universal state, the seat of the Roman Empire, exactly, and of the Roman Catholic Church. Let me read the opening passage, though, from the first two cantos of the Divine Comedy, where Dante and Virgil establish the respective identities. The first quotation starts at Canto One, line 64 with the exchange between Dante and Virgil. Dante starts first. When, when I saw, uh, seeing him near in the great wilderness, to him I screamed, my miserere, save me, whatever, whoever you shadow or truly man you are. And that's the uh, Virgil's answer, um, which I, ha I could not have said any better and I find the passage, the ideal model, thank you, um, as following. He says, Risposi, let me read this in Italian. Non uomo, non uomo, uomo già fui, e di parenti miei furono lombardi, mantovani per patria ambedue. Poeta fui, e cantai di quel giusto figlio d'anchise. Ma tu perché ritorni a tanta noia? O sei tu quel Virgilio, quella fonte che spandi? O degli altri poeti, onore e lume, vagliami il lungo studio e grande amore? che mi ha fatto cercarlo tu volume. Tu, this is the words, Dante's words to Virgil, you are my master and my author. Tu sei lo mio maestro e il mio autore. 
Tu sei colui da cui ho tolsi lo bello stile uh, che mi ha fatto onore. You are him, or you are he who, from whom I took the beautiful style that has given me so much honor. Uh, but all of this, this way of uh, meeting and uh, gui guiding and so on and so forth, all of this, I must say, is a preamble to the final appearance of Virgil in the narrative. So I go from the beginning where they finally meet and, and, and Virgil will be the guide to what happens when he disappears in the poem. This happens in Canto 30 of Purgatorio, immediately after the symbolic pageant, 24 elders, the seven golden candlesticks, etc. The procession, there's a procession there holds. All are shouting, Benedictus qui venis, blessed is he who is coming it's interrupted, but you may understand what the uh, remaining line would be. And then Veni sponsor the Libano, uh, and the O Manibus Odate Lilia Plenis, which is Purgatorium 30, uh, within a, warm, a cloud of flowers. This is the situation, all of this is preamble to the event of the end of um, Purgatorio when Beatrice, uh, when, when Virgil disappears. Within a cloud of, uh, uh, of flowers, a woman appears, uh, sovra candido ver cinta d'oliva. Beatrice appears, and in a fear uh, of a, um, uh, an entrapment, she starts, the fear of trembling in, the, in, the, in her presence, uh, uh, looks, behind, uh, looks behind him. This is Dante, looks behind him to say to, um, to Virgil, uh, barely a dram of blood then trembles. Uh, is left from me still. But Virgil, swift father, had forsaken them, and the voice is heard, Dante, that Virgil um, goes his way, uh, do not weep now, do not do that yet. It is Beatrice looks at, um, at me there, yes, I am, I am, yes, I am Beatrice. He see Dante sees Beatrice, and terrorized by the encounter with her, he had not been uh, very loyal, to, to her till you know, the very day, day that uh, she died, uh, he's scared of the encounter and uh, uh, turns around to look at Virgil and Virgil has disappeared. I have to say one little personal note. This scene is particularly significant to me because it reminds me of an old teacher of mine very, quite a few years ago, a German professor, a distinguished professor by the name of Ulrich Leo who was teaching, left Germany just before the war, came to the United States, then moved to Canada, and, uh, and the University of Toronto. Every time he would read, and he would read this passage every day, practically in public, he would start crying. To him, the scene of Virgil's disappearance was unbearable. Uh, he must have recalled uh, uh, the close friends, I guess, he had lost during the war, the pain of losing a spiritual companion. Maybe he was not crying during uh, the class for Virgil's disappearance, but only for the joy that Virgil will never leave his readers. So this is where my uh, time now uh, comes to a stop. Thank you. Thank you to Michael, Molly, and Giuseppe for helping us open up the door to this 2020 New York encounter. This is the message we received from the Vatican. On the occasion of the New York encounter sponsored by Communion and Liberation, His Holiness Pope Francis sends cordial greetings and prayerful best wishes to all gathered for this annual meeting. His Holiness trusts that these days of dialogue and fellowship will promote that culture of encounter so necessary in our times in which people of goodwill are committed to find points of agreement amid conflict, build bridges, and make peace for the benefit of all. Upon the organizers and those taking part in the 2020 encounter, his Holiness invokes the divine blessings of wisdom, joy, and peace. 
And, and, and now we have a great friend who would like to greet you all and greet us all. Uh, he's been with us, you know, a constant presence, and we're very grateful um, to him for this. His Eminence Cardinal O'Malley. Good evening, everyone. After this sublime music and reflections on Dante, I feel like uh, I'm one of those silly commercials at the Super Bowl that they bring at the halftime or something. But uh, I often share with people one of my favorite stories is about a man who goes to the doctor because he's very sick and the doctor does all these tests on him. And at one point, the doctor asks to speak to the wife. And the doctor says, your husband is very sick. And the only way that he will recover is if you take very good care of him. And she said, what do you mean, doctor? He said, well, serve him his favorite meals. Let him go to the sporting events with his buddies and go fishing. And don't ask him to take out the garbage or shovel the snow. And, and let him have the remote control for the television set. <laughs> and don't invite his mother-in-law over too often. And if you do all these things, I'm sure that he's going to get well. Well, on the way home, the man was very nervous and he said to his wife, what did the doctor say? What did the doctor say? His wife said, honey, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> Well, the moral of the story is, of course, and as, Saint Fr as Pope Francis is always reminding us, we are here with a mission to take care of one another. And part of that mission is, as the theme of this New York encounter reminds us, is crossing the divide. What a great challenge that is in today's world. Communion liberation resonates with so many of the very central themes in the pontificate of Pope Francis. A culture of encounter, Francis is always talking about that. The art of accompaniment, tenerezza, tenderness, vicinanza, being close to people, using the via pulcritudinis, the way of beauty to evangelize, to help people to be able to glimpse the goodness and the beauty of God. That's what Molly was doing tonight with her beautiful music. This week, Pope Francis has given us the post-synodal exhortation, Querida Amazonia, beloved Amazonia, it's been described as a love letter from Pope Francis. And his love is for our common home, our earth, our planet. And his love is for all of those who are on the margins. It was my privilege to be at the Synod. Uh, I think the impression was, that was created about the importance of the Synod was uh, very deceiving. To me, what moved me the most was being with a couple of hundred missionaries who are risking their lives to carry the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I had three friends, bishops, who were all murdered in their ministry working in Latin America. And another, my classmate, working with the indigenous people in Blue Fields, at one point they threw a hand grenade into his Jeep, killed one of the nuns with him, blinded the other, and blew off part of his arm. The first theme that Francis held up for us at the Synod was the response that we need to make to violence. The Amazon 
is an area where people and the earth itself are suffering from so much violence. But we are here to take care of each other, to show the world that we are capable of crossing the divide and that there is a connectedness, an interdependence that is so important. In today's world, so many people want to embrace euthanasia. It's attractive because then I don't have to be a burden on other people. There's that famous scene in the life of Father Flanagan of Boys Town when he comes upon an orphan carrying his little brother and he offers to help. And the orphan says, oh, Father, he's not heavy, he's my brother. That has to be our attitude. I'm delighted, of course, having been a classics major, that we're beginning tonight with Dante. Uh, Michael Rogers did an extraordinary job of proclaiming uh, the poetry, and I'm so grateful for Professor Mansota's interpretation of this genius who's one of the great pillars of Western civilization. Our Beatrice in the Paradiso is Olivetta Danese. <laughs> if she did not work so hard, this annual climb together that lifts us above the routine and the din of our daily life and allows us to experience communion with God and each other in this special encounter that does liberate us from the extreme individualism and stultifying materialism of our age. Thank you, Oliveta. It's not by accident that we begin this encounter on the feast of St. Valentine. Think of it, every young man can offer his beloved roses, chocolates, and the New York encounter. <laughs> Doesn't get any better. <laughs> Poor St. Valentine has been co-opted by hallmark cards and romantic love. We know little for sure about his life, but we know that he was a martyr. In the early church, martyrdom was the great ideal of all Christians. The Colosseum, the catacombs, the countless churches in Rome with relics of the early martyrs are a reminder of this. And in today's Rome, if you go to the Isola Turbantina, to San Bartolomeo, the trusted to the San Egidio community, at the request of Pope John Paul II, has been made a shrine to the 20th century martyrs. Martyr means witness. Their witness helped the early Christians to cross the divide. Peter converted some of his jailers. Cardinal von Tuan also converted his. And there are many legends about St. Valentine bringing his jailers to the light of Christ. As children in my generation, our first experience of epistolatory tradition was sending valentines, big paper hearts, be my valentine. The sisters taught us how to address the envelopes in very now defunct terminology, Master John, Mistress Mary Ellen, dipping our wooden speedball pens into the, <laughs> into the inkwell and writing in cursive writing. Remember what that is? <laughs> Letter writing has gone into the same dustbin as calling children master and mistress, only to be replaced by email, WhatsApp, Facebook, etc. The complimentary clothes and the purple patches of great literary prowess have been replaced with the thumbs up, the like symbol. And I doubt if the publication of Hillary Clinton's emails will rival the epistles of Abelard and Heloise. But St. Paul tells us, it's clear that you are Christ's letter, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of Christ, carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. Let our Valentine be that message 
written in the Spirit on our hearts as we strive together to cross the divide in a world where there is so much polarization and so much globalization of indifference. To witness to something and someone greater than ourselves that draws us together, gives us hope and inspires us to love because we have discovered that we are loved by God with an unconditional and a gratuitous love. Happy St. Valentine's Day and welcome to the great New York encounter. Thank you.